you wind up doing is exactly what you should be doing. And I have not behaved one single day of my life. Not one day of my life have I behaved, and I am fine. I need your help. I can't tell you what it is. You can never ask me about it later, and we're going to hurt some people. Who's car we're going to take? Thank you for joining me on the Nikki Maduro Show, live on YouTube, starting at noon Pacific. A big thank you to all of you who have reached out to Kim McAllister, who was rocking it while I was off with my daughter. She did have surgery. I'll give you a bit of an uh, update in just a moment. Loving all of you who are here, and, and thank you for, honestly, all your kind notes. It's amazing. Um, the community that we formed in such a short amount of time. I know from Station X over to here, uh, but it's different when, you know, personal life kind of blends into you trying to launch something big. And and that's what I'm trying to do with this show along with Kim McAllister. And it, it's tough taking time off and not feeling like I'm, I'm, I'm giving everything to you guys, but we're hoping, hoping that we have turned a corner with my daughter. Uh, I do also want to say thank you to our exclusive founding sponsor, Steve Moskowitz. Steve Moskowitz is the guy to call. It is officially tax season. And I'm not even lying. I swear, last night I was running through my mind of all these things I have to get ready because I'm going to be using Steve, obviously, to handle some business and, and tax situations. So give Steve a call so you can stop tossing and turning. 888-TAX-DEAL, MoskowitzLLP.com. Uh, if we could start the show with a big thumbs up, it would really help us out. It's a quick and easy and free way to support the show and help us grow our audience here on YouTube. So I'd really, really appreciate it. Um, if you want to become part of the Medorable crew, join my Patreon. You can find the link to Patreon, my Patreon page, as well as our YouTube shows that you could share with your family and friends at thenikkimadoroshow.com. That's thenikkimadoroshow.com. We've also been taking donations through PayPal. Email there, thenikkimadoroshow at gmail.com. I do have some merch. It's it's missing because we'll also get, we'll get into this as well. I am moving this week because I did not have enough on my plate. So um, because I'm moving, I'm slowly, you don't even want to know what the room looks like behind this camera. It is, my whole house is in disarray. So I have a, a, a child that is recovering from major surgery. My house is filled with boxes and I think I packed too many things too early because I realized I don't have a pot to pee in right now because I packed them all. So we'll get through some tips and tricks coming up, but I do usually have merchandise here. I want to show some pictures though. Can I do this really quickly? Yeah, let me take down the music. Um, I got some pictures from some listeners. Uh, Jim Slayton, I'm going to have to call you out because you sent it on social media. So I'm assuming you don't mind people seeing this picture, but I will have to say Jim wins the award for like, at least in the moment of supporting uh, the host that left Station X, myself, Mark Thompson. Look at this picture. Jim Slayton with the Mark Beanie, the Mark Thompson Show Beanie, and the Nikki Maduro Show t-shirt. Jim, thank you. Uh, I loved that picture. It did accompany a Go Niners tweet, which unfortunately, we'll get into it. Um, KGO's former sports director, Rich Walkoff, who I know was on last week with Kim, saying that the Niners were going to lose. Boo. Uh, he's going to be back on with us, and we'll discuss it. I'm getting vilified um, for kind of, not really, but kind of defending the Trent Williams slam. Uh, I'll get into that with Rich Walkoff as well. But, you know, yeah, it's, it was a very disappointing game yesterday. Very, very disappointed. But thank you to Jim with that picture. I was also, you know, I want to show some other pictures. Uh, David with the Nikki Maduro Show cup right there. And again, you can get it at thenickymaduroshop.com is where you can get all of this uh, merchandise. Uh, we did add some hoodies that I've gotten some orders for. So we have it in white with a black, and, and you're gonna see the um, the radio tower up right right there. So white uh, hoodie 
with a black radio tower and of course the logo on the back and then we also have it in black with a red radio tower and then of course the the logo on the back uh we've also had some orders for the airpod cases this is the airpod pro and this is the regular one i believe i have that right so you can pick those up as well and again you can find it all on the shop's website, the Nikki Maduro And, uh, and I really just appreciate everybody supporting the show in this way. And of course, of course, uh, you know, helping share the show by wearing the merch, not just my show, obviously Mark Thompson show. And, um, it just really, really helps us out. And the, the super chat of course is also live. I know so many of you like to donate that way during the show. Uh, you can throw us some dollars, a couple bucks, a lot of bucks, whatever you can manage, of course. It's in the comment section right underneath the box. You guys that donate know how that works. And you can even donate during the replay if you can't uh, watch the show live. But again, I really love all of you. Um, so a quick update on my daughter, uh, because I know so many of you have been reaching out uh, with your own stories. I've been trying. I think I've I've emailed everybody back. If I haven't, please uh, reach out again, because I, I really have been trying to take some time to reach out to everybody. Uh, but for those that are just catching up, my daughter was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Literally, I'm, I'm saying like a week and a half after I got laid off from Station X um, and like a week before I launched the show. So I've been all of this has been like a confluence of crap. And um, so she was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Uh, we had her on some infusions. Uh, infleximab was the medication that she was getting infused with. She had three infusions. And then right after New Year's, she got extremely sick. She kept throwing up. And there wasn't a lot because she wasn't hungry. She wasn't really eating. And when she threw up, I was like, mm, it was kind of green. Like She even came to me and she was like, it's green. And I was, I told her, well, it's probably just the bile in your stomach. You don't have any, any food in there. And then I had had following her third infusion, a phone, a phone appointment with her GI doctor. And when I told her GI doctor that it was green and I was just kind of making the excuse that it was bile, he's like, mm, we got to bring her in. And so I brought her in and that was my first long stint with her in the hospital. And they were in all kinds of tests and CAT scans. I cannot overstate enough how amazed, and she had a lot of people coming in the room, doctors, nurses, you know, experts saying they did not understand one, why she wasn't doubled over in pain constantly. And it's interesting when you look back at the signs that you may have missed. I remember when I first was, you know, talking with her GI doctor, we, you know, we were kind of teaming up on this. He asked me this question in kind of a weird way. And I keep going back to it. He was like, so how is she? And I'm like, oh, she's fine. She was hanging out with her friends. And this was right at the beginning. And he's like, okay, okay, wow, okay. And it was like, shouldn't she be? You know, I understand that she has Crohn's, but we're kind of managing it. Come to find out, you know, especially since she's now had this surgery, they think that not only one has she had this huge amount of inflammation and scarring for like three years, she should be like swollen. When they touch her, it should be painful. None of those things with my daughter. So then last week, she had the surgery. They took out probably between 6 and 12 inches of her intestine. It was rock hard. The doctor's like, it was just wanting to come out. Now, there is some good news, which I'm really excited about, is that the, the, looking around in there, this is the disease portion that they removed. Everything else looked so clean. They were able, thank God, to reattach her. And so now we're just going to try to get her better, uh, watch her diet, see what works, what doesn't work. You know, the kid wants to immediately go back to eating crap food. And as a mom, I'm just like, no, we need to really, you know, just pay attention to what we're putting in her body, which we should all be doing. And so I'm really hoping that this is kind of something that as a family we're going to do together. But so she's home now. I hope she's only off for this week of school. And again, in that whole thing, we're also trying to move. Um, now you're asking yourself, why are you moving? We're not moving far. We're kind of moving closer uh, to all of their activities and things like that, but still in the same school district and all those sorts of things. 
But, you know, if anybody has any like good tips and tricks on <laughs> moving, because my house is in absolute disarray. But did you see this? And this is, this cracked me up when I saw it. Who in the chat knows who Marie Kondo is? Did anybody condo their house? Condo their drawers? Show of hands. So if you don't know who Marie Kondo is, she is the author of, the book is called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, The Japanese Art of Decluttering and Organizing. I mean, it was off the shelves like hotcakes, okay? Well, she just came out. Where did I see this? I saw this in the Washington Post. NPR was covering it as well. Uh, she recently told some people, now I realize what is important to me is enjoying spending time with my children at home. Uh, she's like, I've given, I have kind of given up on that way of tidying her home in a good way. Uh, basically, she was the woman behind, if you hold something, do you, does it spark joy in you? And if it's not sparking joy, you're supposed to consider giving it up. She said something along the lines of you should only have like 30 books in your house, which I mean, I know how many books I have way too many books, but I have like so many boxes filled with books. And um, yeah, Eric, I'm not getting rid of my books. They all bring me joy. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so it was, she was one of these people. She, I think she had a Netflix series as well. I think I watched, she had this book, but she's now even admitted it's not working. Um, she has three kids. She did this folding style where you try to get your shirts, for instance, in a rectangle, like in, in, it would end up like this, right? I mean, it would have to stand on its own. I tried, I did it. I did my all of my drawers in this way. Every single time I pulled something out of my drawers, and I don't know if I was doing it wrong, were wrinkled to high heaven. Um, and so I, I didn't like it screw it. Why am I folding my clothes in this way? Taking all of this time. Yes, I was able to see what was in my drawers, but my clothes were all wrinkled. Uh, let's welcome Kim McAllister to the show. So Kim, um, I was telling people that in addition to being in charge of a daughter who's recuperating from major surgery, mm -hmm. I am moving this week. We officially get the, the keys tomorrow. We're going to start doing the big move this Wednesday. Ooh. And so my house is everything at once, right? Oh, you know, pours, but my house yeah. is in total disarray. I'm trying to purge things. And then I don't know. Do you know who Marie Kondo is? Have oh, yeah. Of, right. Are you, you condoing? Well, so I condoed a couple of years ago when that whole thing like Netflix and the book and everything were coming out. And yeah. what I was saying before I brought you on is all of my shirts, if I folded my shirts, like mm -hmm. I have tons of t shirts in that way that she was saying, the con Mari method or whatever, mm -hmm. every time I pulled them out, they were wrinkled and I would like smooth them out. But just the whole of like all these folds wasn't working for me. And so I was like, right. screw it, I'm going back to the old, stack I it up, look underneath kind of thing. I thought she did the roll, the t-shirt roll. Well, let me see if I can, well, okay. So what it is, is you take your shirt and mm -hmm. you're supposed to fold in each side. So it's a rectangle and uh -huh. then you're supposed to half it and oh. then half it again. So it's not exactly a roll, okay. but unless I was doing it wrong, every time I pulled it out, there was just way too many folds in it. Um, so it looked nice in the drawer. Right. Then I'd pull it out, I'm like, now I got to iron? No. I don't iron if no. I don't have to. So. So I did the, my kids switched over to rolling their shirts. Okay. And, and rolling you like their that? leggings and pants. And I can tell you that it makes a huge difference as far as seeing what's where. Yes. So yes, that's yes, yes, been yes, yes. really helpful. Yeah, I like. I do like the. Rolling. I roll. I roll like uh, dresses, skirts. If I'm going, you know, if I'm packing them to right. go somewhere, because that does kind of help eliminate supposedly yeah. all of the wrinkles. But yeah, I love that Joanne agrees with me. Hold on, my my t-shirts were wrinkled too. Thank you. Now maybe yeah. I'm, maybe I'm just supposed to be doing it with like thicker sweaters, like what I'm wearing right now, and I wouldn't see it. But I wear t-shirts ninety percent of the time, yeah. and so. I sure as hell don't want to be, you know, doing all that. But anyways, Marie Kondo has even said she's giving up being so tidied because she wants to live a joyful life and no one wants to spend, <laughs> hey, no one got time for all that folding and rolling or whatever the hell you want to go. Uh, but yeah. Have, so Have you been asking yourself as you throw things away or you purge for this move? Does it bring me joy? 
Oh, you know, joy is purging. But what is not bringing me joy is this house is a disaster. Stop. I mean, uh... I have packed too many things. So, for instance, you know, we were watching the Niner game. And again, after the bottom of the hour news or, you know, in about 15 minutes or so, mm -hmm. uh, former sports director over at Station X, um, Steve, uh, Rich Walcoff will be joining mm -hmm. us to talk about the Niner game. But so we did a huge pack up on Saturday night. <laughs> then I was like, shoot, packed up all my pots. Like I have my cast iron, but we're doing the kitchen. So like all the China and we're just trying to empty things. And I'm like, shoot. So everything has to either be cooked in the microwave yep. on a, in the oven, on a, like a cookie sheet in the cast iron or a microwave or something like that, because we have no pots and pans, nothing to boil anything. So that makes it like all my measuring cups I packed. So it's yeah. this weird like time where I'm half in half out, but yeah, we'll get the keys tomorrow, and then maybe I could slowly just start bringing things over before the big big move. Yeah. But I just want to throw everything away. We have garbage bags everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we're getting a dumpster, but the dumpster is not going to be dropped off until this weekend, so we can move and throw things away. But I'm just excited about it. I don't want to. I want to purge so much stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, get rid. But I can't get, get rid of too much stuff. Or I'm going to sit red. there and I'm going to have to rebuy crap. And that's the last thing I want to do. <laughs> trying to save some money over here. So yeah. it's difficult. But yeah, um, the house is a little bit bigger. It's near my kid. It's still in my kid's school district. So it's not like that kind of move. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a lot more room. And it's a lot closer to their activities, which I was wasting. And parents, you'll feel me no matter what age your kids are. The amount of time you waste when activities are too far from home is ridiculous i mean i was working in my car because it didn't make sense to drive all the way home because it was like a 25 minute drive you know and so this the the place where we're moving again i'm staying in san jose i'm not moving very far i'm just moving closer to my kids lives and all of their activities and it's going to really be a godsend but yeah the amount of gas time time i'm going to get to myself uh it's just going to be amazing so i just got to get through this yeah. this weekend and then next week next week i'm sure it'll be fabulous so i'm very, I hope very excited the, i hope the landlady turns out to be nice oh i've met her i mean yeah. i've been interacting with her yeah. you know in, in this whole process of getting it uh, uh her and her husband seem like very nice people um and so i'm hoping of course fingers crossed because you know guys i've been renting from my parents for yeah. years so <laughs> Kind of had an in with the landlord, <laughs> but we've moved a lot. When my husband and I lived in Sacramento, uh, we moved like four times in five years. And so we were, oh, we always got our deposits back. We're pretty good with that sort of thing. So yeah, I, I'm a good tenant and I just hope for a good landlord. I think they, they look pretty nice. So it'll be, yeah. it'll be okay. Um, now on that move, I was asking this question and you tell me, Kim, what do you think? Do you think that the Curries are NIMBYs? Do you oh, know the story? I so, don't know the story. Oh, okay. So Steph and Aisha Curry right there, they live in Atherton, okay? Right. They wrote a letter, an email, to Mayor Bill Widmer and the city manager. And they're basically asking the town of Atherton to stop or not build dense housing near their home. This is what they wrote. They said, we hesitate to add to the not in our backyard, literally rhetoric, but we <laughs> wanted to send a note before today's meeting. Uh, safety and privacy for us and our kids continues to be our top priority mm -hmm. and one of the biggest reasons we chose Atherton as home. With the density being proposed for 23 Oakwood Boulevard, there are major concerns and concerns in terms of both privacy and safety with three story townhomes looming directly behind us. And so apparently the city council, and I love this. I love that they say it this way. The city council reluctantly, reluctantly uh, agreed to rezone parts of the town to make way for more affordable housing because you remember why. If the state rejects the plan, then the town will be subject to builder's remedy, which means landowners could build dense housing without the oversight or approval of local officials. 
Um, so they're supposed to have a public hearing on this tomorrow uh, regarding the resolution for the housing element. And now the Curries have thrown their voices to this and said, you know, because of who we are and our kids, yeah. we would really appreciate these three-story townhomes not being built behind our house. So Your they thoughts? lived in the East Bay. I think they had a home in... I want to say Arinda Lafayette, somewhere like that, that they sold. And they they must have relocated to the peninsula, to Atherton. <laughs> hey, Nugget, Sorry. what's that? Sorry, Nugget. So I have, to, I have to think that if I'm the Currys and you, you have such notoriety and, you know, you want to keep your life private and you want to keep your children safe, I completely understand where they're coming from. I, they're not... I mean, okay, so I don't know what it's like to have that kind of money, but I would imagine that there's always a threat to the safety of your family, right? Well, there's a threat to anybody's family. Look, I this mean, is what my I... husband says. If we win the billion dollar lottery, you know, you can't stay in your current house because there's going to be people that will come kidnap your children to sure. get the money, whatever. He's thinking big. I like the way he's thinking. This is great. Uh, but if I'm with Steph Curry, I'm always thinking that way. I'm always thinking I have to protect my family and a three-story condo right in the back of your house, you know, that maybe looks into your yard that maybe, you know, has more people milling about the neighborhood and your area. I'm, if I'm Steph Curry, I'm worried about it. I, I, I can't blame the guy for that. And I now, can't blame Aisha for that as she's right. trying to protect her kids too. I, I completely agree. So I agree with everything that you said. I understand the motivation, but at the same time, should, and I, we've asked this question before many times, should there be areas where there just shouldn't be dense housing because of the people that, that live there? I mean, you're talking about a really yeah. rich area. So the rich people don't have to carry any sort of weight of dealing with the fact that we need to build more housing. Is Atherton now exempt because people like the Curry's live there or is there another way and i want to be fair with this because the curries did actually offer up a suggestion they said we kindly ask that the town adopts the new housing element without the inclusion of 23 oakwood boulevard so obviously they want a little caveat mm -hmm. for them should that not be sufficient for the state we ask that the town commits to investing in considerably taller fencing and landscaping to block sight lines onto our family's property. Yeah. And that is what I fully 100% support. I think that, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're going to try to help carry the burden of building more housing, then those that have valid concerns about their safety and privacy should be allowed to build taller fences, maybe have shrubs or trees or whatever mm -hmm. in order to kind of protect that. That is a compromise I could support. Not building any housing whatsoever because you happen to be rich and famous seems like it's up to the rest of us poorer mm -hmm. folk to handle the burden, which isn't fair in my opinion. Uh, you know, you're right. Although I would say that in the Curry's situation, they do a lot for the Bay Area community. They have donated to schools. I believe they have donated to shelters and homeless. Uh -huh. It's not like they're it's not like they're not people who don't try to give back in some way, who try to better the life of, you know, folks that don't have much at all. Oh, of course. And I'm not so, saying that. Yeah. Yeah. And so I mean, well But I, I mean, is that enough? I mean, it's like, okay, I'll I'll give money, I'll give money, I'll give, but just don't get too close to me. Don't live too close to me. I mean, what are they saying about the people that would live in these townhomes that they're stalkers? I, I mean, you don't know. That's the thing is you, you don't, don't ever know. know, though. But then also you've got people then constantly taking pictures of the curries in their backyard because the windows overlook it. They could have anyone in their house overlooking into the curries backyard, yes. selling them to the National Enquirer and publications. True. I just okay. feel like there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens when you're rich and famous. So we have that, to protect you above all else, above well, like the housing crisis that we know, have. But and... He's got a duty to protect his family. So I understand why he wrote the letter. I understand why I wrote the letter. And again, mm -hmm. I'm just playing devil's advocate with the whole yeah. thing, because I do agree with you. I think that when you talk about, especially a power couple like the Currys, right, that did all the things that you're saying, uh, you know, not only do they have great careers in and of themselves, but they do give back to the community. It just, it doesn't sit easy in my stomach when we talk about certain towns or certain cities or certain neighborhoods and zip codes right. with certain people, not really being part 
of what it means to live in the Bay Area. That if you have enough money that you can basically write an email that says, I understand there's a problem, but I need to take care of my own. And so we can't have that coming closer. It just doesn't sit easy with me. I I like the idea of better shrubbery and landscaping, but saying no off the bat, like, sorry, my safety and privacy trumps the crisis that is happening around us. Well, I think there's a difference between, you know, the riffraff can't come in and the person who doesn't have a big name, they're just happen to have some wealth and they don't want, you know, other people near them. There's that person which no, I don't agree. But then there's someone like the Currys that uh, people like the Currys that I think have a valid, legitimate safety concerns. And that's different. Okay. So Randy's calling me out saying, you can't say that you agree with what Kim is saying and then go, but, but, but I can't, I can agree that, hold on. I can agree that the Currys do things for the community. I can agree that the Currys have a valid concern, Mm -hmm. but Randy, so does the rest of the state and the Bay Area that has to deal with this housing yeah. crisis. That's what my butt is about. It's not saying that they're terrible people and they don't care about people. I'm not saying that. I do agree with Kim. They seem like great people, but they are also part of the community and no amount of money should alleviate your role and responsibility in being part of that community. And I think the the butts allow us to really think through the whole scenario, right. you know, but well, what about this angle? But what about that? Right. angle? And so I don't think that uh, it's wrong to agree with one thing, but still consider in the, for the sake of the argument, right. another, another issue. Yeah. Calvin writes in, it would be nice if average people's lives matter too. Like no pollution to poison us by corporations or luxury cars, almost running me over oh, on the highway. No. When do average people's lives matter? They no. do exactly. But money talks, right? And so, and, and Steph and Aisha Curry, they're rich, they're famous. They do have valid concerns about their privacy and protection because of both of those things. Uh, Vilma says, yeah, I believe the Curries deserve their privacy. I think everybody deserves privacy, except people can make money off of intruding on the Curry's privacy. Um, Wes writes in a good point. Everyone does it. We all agree that we need landfills, power plants, housing, but no one wants them close to where they live. I also think that there is a stereotype that comes with high density housing. Everyone wants affordable housing. Everybody wants people to have shelter. But then when you build it, it seems that we have this image in our minds about what type of person will be either living there or renting there or Mm -hmm. using these services. And then that gives us pause. Instead of thinking like, what about just people that don't make well into the six figures and need a place to live. They're yeah. they're the people that you encounter at the grocery store and and within your community, they need housing too. And so this kind of boogeyman aspect of they're going to bring an element to my hoity-toity neighborhood isn't fair as well. So these could be townhomes of people that make decent money, maybe even rich in any other part of the country type of money, but when you're here, it just it just doesn't. Um And also, well, if you live in Atherton, you should be making a certain level of money. So you wouldn't need to live in a townhome, which also is stereotypical. And um, and we all need to share this burden of housing all the people that live in California. So, um, oh, and let's let's end with Karen's, because I think that this is what they might actually end up doing. If you don't like what's happening in your neighborhood, you can move. Everyone has rights, not just the rich. Yeah, I mean, and the Currys, like Kim mentioned, they have moved before. So maybe, maybe uh, if they can't reach some sort of agreement with the town of Atherton, they're going to be out. Um, Okay, so we're going to do Kim's news. Uh, When we come back, we're going to uh, talk with uh, KGO's former sports director, Rich Wolkoff. Now, if I would have been here during this conversation last week, I would have been very upset of this man <laughs> for jinxing my team. But the truth of the matter is, we were the underdogs in this in this game against the oh, Eagles. So, hold what? on, I'll pay off. Uh, Rich Walkoff's calling me. Hold on for his. Okay, uh, so I I do believe that you know we were the underdogs. It was going to be a hard game to to actually win, but I wanted it to be a game. And I think that that's what I'm most disappointed about. Let me just play you while, while Kim is doing that. I wanted to, I want to show you this. This is Fred Warner, of course, a huge player on the San Francisco 49ers. And he was talking about, you know, Brock Purdy 
being out so early in the game and how disappointed, you know, we obviously all were in what happened. Uh, but this is what he had to say about, you know, Pro Brock, Tur Brock Purdy being disappointed. He ain't got nothing to be sad about. You know, he's the, one, he's the reason we even got to this game. When Jimmy went down against the Dolphins, like, we didn't know what our season was going to be, you know. Um, he came in and did a heck of a job. He's the reason we're here right now. Um, and like I said, unfortunately, what happened, uh, you know, him getting hurt and Josh getting hurt, uh, we just <sighs> couldn't do enough to, to find a way to win. And it was so disappointing. I just, I wanted a game. I wanted a matchup. And unfortunately, we just didn't have the matchup. But again, not making excuses. And the reason why I'm not making excuses is because injuries happen. And Brock Purdy would not have been the quarterback for the 49ers if it had not been for a major injury to Jimmy Garoppolo. And so these are all part and parcel of the same damn sport. Also, I want to talk about uh, Trent Williams, the slam heard around the NFL. Uh, and I'm kind of defending it a bit. Now, let's take, obviously, the brutality of the game to the side. Who was in the wrong here and how did it start? We'll talk about that. Uh, is Rich going to be able to, to join us, Kim? Oh, wait, you're muted here. Oh, sorry. Wait, I just needed there. to send him uh, the link for whatever reason he didn't have it. Oh, I emailed so, it to him. He must. Yeah. I must have been in spam. Rich you Walker. must have been in spam. So he should be joining us any minute. If Hopefully what I sent him works okay, and he'll perfect. join us. Okay, yeah. perfect. Okay, so we'll talk about that. You guys tell me, uh, what did you think about Trent Williams' slam? And was it justified at all? Uh, again, click that thumbs up button. It really helps the show. We'll talk with uh, KJO's uh, former sports director, Rich Walkoff. Also, in the next hour, we will, of course, get into the Tyree Nichols video. We'll also get into mm -hmm. the Paul Pelosi video. And I want to discuss in the next hour, should we, just as average citizens, be watching all of these body cam videos. Does it serve us? So that's coming up in the second half of the show. Talk some football with Rich Walkoff next. But first, some news. Now from around the world to up your street, the Nikki Maduro Show presents News Czar Kim McAllister. And this report sponsored by tax attorney Steve Moskowitz at 888 Tax Deal. We'll start with Tyree Nichols because this is a big story. The Bay Area now joining nationwide protests demanding justice for Tyree Nichols. Hundreds marched through downtown Oakland yesterday, chanting, carrying signs. It's the latest show of support for the Tennessee man who died three days after a traffic stop. The video released Friday shows the 29-year-old beaten by five police officers who have since been fired and arrested. Family members of local residents killed by police spoke to the crowd. Uh, meanwhile, attorneys for Tyree Nichols' family are not happy with an officer who was relieved of duty uh, that he hasn't been officially fired or criminally charged yet. Ben Crump and Antonio Romanucci called the news extremely disappointing. The Memphis Police Department confirmed Preston Hemphill is currently under investigation for his alleged role in Nichols' beating death, and his attorney says he is completely cooperating with officials. In Half Moon Bay, officials trying to heal after last week's mass shooting uh, in that community. There is going to be a memorial and a candlelight procession to be held tomorrow in Half Moon Bay. That is where police say a man killed seven uh, current and former co-workers on two farms one week ago today. Hundreds turned out in the city for a vigil Friday night. A memorial was also held in San Jose yesterday to honor the victims and the only survivor. The suspect is expected to be arraigned next month. Charges are set to be filed officially in the case of Alec Baldwin uh, for the shooting on the movie set of Rust. Uh, Baldwin and armorer Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, uh, he and the armorer, are being charged with involuntary manslaughter in the death of cinematographer Helena Hutchins. Baldwin fired a prop gun on the set last year, which contained live rounds and struck and killed Hutchins while also injuring the film's director as well.
The FAA making some changes in the hope the computer system won't go belly up again. The FAA's system went out January 11th, disrupting thousands of flights across the United States. The agency's acting administrator wrote in a letter to lawmakers it fixed a problem to stop a corrupt file that was damaging the backup database. And the Biden administration is moving to expand access to birth control under the Affordable Care Act, commonly known as Obamacare. The Department of Health and Human Services has proposed a rule to remove the moral exemption set in place under the Trump administration. The mandate allows employers to opt out of offering coverage of contraceptive services for moral reasons. This report, sponsored by tax attorney Steve Moskowitz. For more than 30 years, Steve has put his tax knowledge to work for individuals and for businesses. If you need help with your taxes, any tax questions, anything at all, call Steve Moskowitz. He's at 888-TAX-DEAL. He's also at MoskowitzLLP.com. I'm Kim McAllister on The Nikki Maduro Show. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, give Steve Moskowitz a call. He's an amazing guy. You'll absolutely love him if you pick up the phone and and give him a call for any of your tax needs. Um, We have another question that we've addressed a couple of times on this show, Kim. And that, of course, is the blue orb behind you. Uh, It is a moon, people. It uh, It is a moon that lights up different colors. My daughter got one for Christmas and so did Kim McAllister. So there you go. Oh, you're on mute. You're muted. You're muted. <laughs> I was trying to call Rich Walcott. He says our link isn't working. But um, okay. I'll if try you to want to handle that, again. I'll yeah. tell you this because this is kind of cool. So it's this moon, this light up moon that I discovered on the best gift uh, gifts under the men's health men's health magazine, and you can change the color. So there's purples and blues. You can change it to orange or red. Uh, turquoise, which I like a lot. You'll see me use that one the most, I think. Uh, That's supposed to be green, but it looks more white on screen. Anyway, so it's got all these colors and you can set it to fade from one color to the next. And I, unless you guys find it annoying, I thought it kind of looked cool sitting here. So I've co-opted it from a child who got it for Christmas, who didn't really open the box and hadn't really been messing with it. So I thought, well, I'll just take that. And I'll put it there on on screen as a light up moon behind me. So that's what I was doing. RJ Dunn. I thought it was Uranus. That's <laughs> Uranus. I love I lo- Uranus. Nobody says that. <laughs> Nobody says Uranus. Remember when when we weren't supposed to say harassment anymore? Harassment. We were supposed to say harassment. Yeah, yeah I don't ever do that either. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm I sent the link again to Rich. He needs it without Safari. I don't know what that means necessarily. The Safari hmm. browser. I don't know how to send it a different way, Rich. Um, so I just sent it to him again. Uh, but maybe you can give him a call and maybe walk him through it as I start to talk a little bit of 49er okay. football. Um, okay. So, you know, the memes are going to start immediately. You know that it's just going to start immediately. I love this shirt, though. Did you guys see this shirt? <laughs> so this was basically... This was this was what happened. I mean, we literally were running out of quarterbacks, and it, it's it's been our problem all season. I don't. Okay, I'm gonna say this. Obviously, I'm a huge San Francisco 49ers fan. I will always be faithful and 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 hope and pray and believe that we are going to win. But I just kept thinking about this entire season as if it was going to be made into a movie. Anybody else do that? I did that all of the time, okay? And I'm like, we have to win. I mean, this is just, the the football gods are gonna look down on us and they're gonna say, look at the season this team has had. You know, from Trey Lance and then Jimmy putting aside his ego to not only stay with the team, but then step in, kicked ass for us and then he gets injured. And then we're like, oh my God, there goes the season so early. And then all of a sudden, Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, comes out of nowhere, goes on this historic winning streak. It has to be, like, at the very least, an amazing game. And that's all I kept waiting for yesterday. I wanted to see this matchup. I wanted to see if if Mr. Irrelevant, Brock Purdy, you know, cool, calm, and collected, could keep his coolness and everything with our amazing O-line and defense, and we could pull through. And even though we're the underdogs, beat the Eagles. Obviously did not happen. Obviously didn't. It was, it was really hard 
to know that the story was over, right? It was really hard to see Brock Purdy injured and know that we weren't even going to get a chance. We weren't even going to get an opportunity to see if we could have, you know, really given, you know, them some sort of some competition, right? If it could have been a real game. Yes, exactly. A Cinderella story. Um, Vilma, I, I really, I, I think of my life in movies sometimes. I think we would all avoid terrible situations if we had a soundtrack behind us, right? Telling us when we were doing something wrong or right. But I just, I loved the story. I thought that we were really going to get a great game. And it wasn't a great game. I mean, the Eagles did not see the same 49ers team that got us to this point. I mean, everybody can can agree on that. But they were worried. Did you see? I mean, now we're going to get into the Trent Williams slam. And I was getting slammed for what I said following it because everyone's like, I'll get into it. Matt Rogers, other people were saying, oh, my God, he should be suspended. Really? Really? All right. But here we go. Look at this. Look at what – now, and people are like, I thought the Niners were classy because we're, we're playing a classy-ass team. They were literally throwing it. That's an egg. That's an egg. <laughs> That's an egg. <laughs> That's an egg. That's an egg. Yeah. That's an egg. So they're throwing eggs at us as we're walking, as we're walking to the stadium. Um, you know, I just feel like if we're going to talk about class and football and all those sorts of things, let's keep it in perspective. Another thing we saw, did you see? And now it was a joke, and I know it's been all over the news, but there was a point where I was beginning to wonder, and, and it happened. I mean, Johnson got hurt. Now, I'm not, he had a concussion and that's terrible. Uh, and if you have a concussion, you need to be pulled. We don't want to, you know, the whole CTE thing and everything. It's serious. But I'm sure he wanted out of that game. And I'm not knocking him. He's been in the NFL, what, I think it said 15 seasons. 15 seasons. And all of a sudden you're, <laughs> you're starting in a playoff game, right? But he wasn't a Brock Purdy. Uh, lightning did not strike twice. Uh, and so people were like, okay, who's going to step in? Well, of course, Steve Young had to throw it in, right? Warming up in the parking lot. Just let me know. Now, my husband was laughing. He thought it was a joke, but no, Steve Young actually tweeted it out. And, of course, they weren't really going to put him in. And, and talking about someone, again, a quarterback who took some pretty brutal hits when he was the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. But, again, got us to the Super Bowl, won. Um, it really – it was such a disappointing uh, end to the game. And, and that it didn't even begin. It, it was over before it began. Uh, Roberto says, I don't think Purdy would have scored more than 30 points to beat the Eagles. Mm. You don't know, though. You don't know. Um, and also, what did it do when Purdy got hurt to the rest of the team and their mentality? Because that's the question. It's like, at first, we're like, okay. Uh, he could just, Johnson could just hand it off. Like we have all these amazing other players. It was a team that got us there. And people say, oh, you could put anyone in that quarterback because our team was so good. No, you do still need a quarterback that can handle the pressure, you know, and then the Johnson's fumbles. And it was just, it was basically a big long, no, the whole entire time. And it was just so disappointing. So I don't know if this is going to work, but I have Rich Walkoff on cell phone. He can go by I, by audio because remember we did this with my daughter and it worked over the phone. Say hi, okay. Rich Walkoff. Hey, what's up? Ah, perfect. Can you hear he, him? Can he hear me? He can't. Well, well, he can't hear me. It's fine. It's that? fine. You know, you just you just relay my questions. Okay. Uh, first off, what does Rich think about? how the game basically was over before it really started. Did he see it that way or was it always going to end this way? I don't think you can hear me. Ken. Nope. Uh, she's asking, what did you think about the game? Did you see it going this way? Did you think it was always going to end this way? What are your thoughts? <laughs> Nobody thought it would go like this. I mean, you know, the Hollywood Cinderella story of Brock Purdy was unfathomable, unbelievable. But nobody envisioned that six plays into the game, he would be hurt so badly that he effectively mm -hmm. couldn't do anything the rest of the way. He came back in and he couldn't even throw anything more than a five-yard pass. So that was just 
a nightmare for 49er fans and the team and a shame that they never really had a shot because the injury that came in the first quarter doomed them. And then, of course, Josh Johnson, the backup quarterback, suffered the concussion uh, not much longer later in the game. And that was all she wrote. Ask Rich if he thinks, and I don't know the rules of it, but remember Patrick Mahomes got injured and stayed in. I think it was like with a sprained ankle. Could Brock Purdy or should Brock Purdy have stayed in and just handed off the ball the whole time? Uh, Nikki's talking about Patrick Mahomes being injured and staying in. She thinks it was a sprained ankle. Do you think that Purdy should have stayed in? Or what do you think the thought, oh, your thoughts And just handed off the ball, you know like, what I mean? Just handed off the ball and, and done, you know, what he could with what he was working with there. Well, that's what they, when he, when he re-entered the game, it was very evident. He couldn't throw the ball at all. He's having an MRI today. Right. There's a thought and a fear that he might have uh, an elbow injury so severe that would require the so-called Tommy John surgery, which would mean he wouldn't play for a year. Mm -hmm. Now that's premature to say that's what happened, but he apparently damaged the ulnar nerve in the elbow and made throwing virtually impossible other than a, a, a five yard pass that he completed when he returned to the game. So he was not, able to function anywhere near at the level needed or expected and against the best pass rush in the league in a hostile environment with all on the line no you, you couldn't expect him to do anything he did what he could which wasn't a whole lot yeah what about the officiating i mean does rich think that especially that that one catch early on that led to the eagles touchdown mm -hmm. obviously the flag should have been thrown but a lot of people are saying the officiating was terrible during this game. Is that just excuses? I was talking about officiating flags not being thrown that should have been. Is that just a bunch of excuses? Or do you think that there's something to poor officiating in this one? Well, of course, it didn't help. But uh, I think it, it wasn't a game-changing uh, decision. The 11 penalties called on the 49ers, one or two of them were suspect. The roughing mm -hmm. the kicker penalty where the player was apparently pushed into the kicker, which should not have been a flag. You know, maybe the most egregious non-call was the drop long one-handed touch uh, yeah. catch by Devontae Smith in the opening drive for the Eagles on fourth and three, and he made the circus catch, which the 49ers never challenged, and the Eagles hurried up to the line of scrimmage yeah, and snapped the ball, making it a moot point. And the uh, follow-up replay showed that the ball clearly was out. Mm -hmm. So, Mike, you know, Kyle Shanahan should have been a little more aggressive in that because the Eagles were in a hurry-up mode, quickly getting to the line to snap the ball in the next play. But I don't think officiating was going to change the outcome of that game, even though there were critical penalties. I think uh, on one drive, there were three penalties that enabled the Eagles to, to score. But that wasn't the difference in this game. It was a, a better team at home, fresh, strong, ready, playing very, very well against a 49er team that suffered critical injuries to both quarterbacks and were left trying to find a fight, a fight with one hand tied behind their back. Yeah. And that's just not going to you're not going to smile when it's all over in that one. Can I ask you about uh, about the injuries? Because we had talked about this texting back and forth last night. And I have a picture up of Brock Purdy's arm being pushed mm -hmm. back Ugh. really far. And it reminded me also of the picture of Debo Samuel's leg being twisted. And I wonder if you think, and am I naive to just now be realizing this, that <laughs> players would actually try to hurt each other and cause injury. I mean, you would think these are guys who know that their careers are on the line every time they walk on the field. Why would they want to, to have, you know, uh, offer a career ending injury to someone like that? And so I wonder, do you think that was purposeful? Well, no, what, what Hassan Reddick did in knocking the arm of the quarterback was entirely legit. Yeah. There was nothing untoward or unsportsmanlike or Ill illegal or anything of the sort. When Debo Samuel was tackled, I guess it was the Cowboys game when he had the he was on the ground and a, a defensive back wrenched his leg. That's egregious, unsportsmanlike. Yeah. It wasn't called at the time, if I recollect. That's a whole different ball of wax. But when a pass rusher, and let, let, let's drop back for a second. 
the 49ers had a backup tight end, Tyler Croft, trying to block one-on-one with the second leading pass rusher, sack master in the league, Hassan Reddick, who was quicker and uh, – and just lightning fast, and he zoomed around him, and, and Purdy on the blind side never saw it, never got out of harm's way. So that's on Kyle Shanahan. He was saying he hoped Brock Purdy would step up into the pocket to avoid the pass rush, and he had Brandon Ayuk on a long throw down the middle of the field on a play-action pass, but it all became moot when Purdy was hammered. But that's just good football by the Eagles. I mean, they have the best pass rush the league has seen since the 1985 Chicago Bears. They had 70 sacks. We talked about that last week. That's going to be something that really would be a difference maker, and it proved to be in in a a way that doomed the 49ers, no question. Ask him, sorry, just ask him what he thinks about the Trent Williams uh, Wallace slam. Uh, Does he think that both sides? I I want to know. I want to (laughs) know if Rich thinks that they were both at fault or that Williams was more at fault because I have my own thoughts on that. So she's asking what you think about the Trent Wallace slam. And she's wondering if you think both players were at fault in this case or just one or what are your thoughts? Well, Trent Williams is the big. Number yeah. 71, the great left tackle of the 49ers. He's just probably the best tackle in all of football and a veteran guy. The frustration, the anger, the disappointment, it, it, it just, he blew a fuse. And I, I know it got kind of, you know, dicey with guys shoving and somebody might have, on the Eagles, might have done something untoward. But Trent Williams has got to know when he throws the guy down like that in a scrum after the play is over, He's at, at least is going to get an unsportsmanlike conduct. He got ejected and probably rightfully so. But I think that's accumulation of all the, as I said, the frustration, the disappointment, the anger. You come this far and the intensity of the moment, it can overwhelm even the most accomplished and, and veteran players like Trent Williams, who was a classy, monstrously talented player. Yeah. I mean, I just think that Kevon Wallace, who was the Philadelphia safety that was holding on to Debo Samuel's mask and not letting go for so long, even as they were trying to prime up, I I'm not, I don't want to see unnecessary roughness or any of that because the game is violent enough. But if you're going to do something like hold on to somebody's mask for that long, mm-hmm. he upped around and found out. And I wouldn't want to go up against, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't want to go against any of them, especially Trent Williams uh, trying to pry me off. But maybe that's just mm-hmm. me making excuses for my team. I don't know. Well, John Slade says the 42 got ejected too. So yeah, yeah. 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 Both players were ejected. But, uh, you know, losing Trent Williams. Well, the game was the game was over at halftime. It was 21-7. Both quarterbacks were out. There was no recourse. The league used to have an emergency third quarterback to be made available in the event that the two uh, top quarterbacks were out. But they no longer have that. They may revisit that. But it doesn't help the Niners today. And, you know, in going ahead, you now look at Brock Purdy, had this magical, you know, glory ride that ended so ingloriously and ignominiously in Philadelphia yesterday. If the MRI shows that his arm is just, yeah. you know, some nerve damage, but not a torn nerve or not needing surgery, he and Trey Lance will compete for the job, but you're not going to get a boost from the draft because the Niners do not have a first round, second round, third round, or fourth round pick for the trades for for Trey Lance and Christian McCaffrey. So they will have to look for help from free agency. Some rumors already about with Tom Brady. Oh, uh, out his career in the red and gold. (laughs) (laughs) No, she's screaming. Uh, No to that. (laughs) Well, Tom Brady over Brock Purdy or Trey Lance. Heck yeah. Even at 46 years old, he and I share the same birthday, August 3. He'll be 46 <laughs> then. And guess what? At 46, Tom Brady, with the weapons the Ford Netters had, have, would be a better option than Trey Lance or Brock Purdy, no question. Wow. I don't agree, but we'll see, I guess. I, I'm just She's not. disagreeing with you, but says we'll see. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> this is a shame you come this far, but only one team smiles out of 32 when it's all said. I know. And done. It's I know. the third time in four years the Niners have, you know, been to the NFC Championship game and lost. They lost a Super Bowl with a 10 point lead in the fourth quarter. They I lost know. last year's NFC Championship game with a 10 point lead in, in the uh, second half. You know, Jimmy Garoppolo was the hero until a disastrous fourth quarter in the Super Bowl. Brock Purdy was the hero until his, uh, you know, unfortunate injury yesterday. Trey Lance was going to be the savior, and Kyle Shanahan had him run inside the tackles, and he broke an ankle and needed surgery. And now the jury is out on what, how effective he'll be with very limited playing experience in entering his third year next season. So, We'll say More question marks than exclamation yeah. points for the Fort Niners going forward. Even though their core group of playmakers return, the critical thing is at quarterback. And if, if Purdy is okay, you, you're in pretty good shape. If he's not, you go to Trey Lance or maybe a, a Tom Brady or a, another veteran you bring in. But Jimmy Garoppolo is certainly uh, going to move on in free agency. Wow. All right. Well, Rach, we love you and we want to have you back and hopefully we'll figure out how to see your face. Yep. She's saying we love you and hopefully next time we'll figure out how to see your face. And thank you for being with us always. Rich Wolkoff, you're super awesome. Oh, uh, you're great. Thanks. Best of luck to you guys. Appreciate okay. thank it. You. Thank All you. Right, that's Bye. A- Rich Walcott, former sports director at Station X KJ Radio. Of that the, holding the phone up to the microphone goes against all my radio girl ways. But it sounded fine. I mean, I could hear it. I, I, I'm okay. thinking everybody else. Nobody else is complaining. I want to see his face though. So, and I'd like him to hear me. But we'll figure it out. We it's crazy. We made it, work. it worked. It worked last I time, know. but it oh, didn't wow. work this time. So I don't know what happened there. But yeah, at least we got him on and and got to hear what he had to say. So you know. I want somebody besides my totally biased ass talking about the 49ers because I will always <laughs> think that we were got robbed. And of course, we're going to win the Super Bowl uh, next next year. You know what's an interesting point I want to throw out real quickly? And you guys tell me if if any of you, and I know, even though I'm a huge Niner fan, that I have some Raider fans in my in my viewers, right? Someone posted yesterday that if you, <laughs> this is a stretch for me. That if you support local, right, like support local businesses and all that, that we should support still, even though they're in Las Vegas, the Raiders. And that, you know, if the 49ers aren't in it, then you root for the Raiders. And if the if the Giants aren't in it, then you root for the A's. Mm-hmm. I said, no, F the Raiders every day of the week and twice on Sunday. <laughs> but that's just me. Um, also, I don't think that there should be any loyalty from the Bay Area for the Raiders anymore. I mean, they have literally pooped on their fan base, well, despite how much the fan base loved them. And there's still so many that are committed to them. I don't get it. Here's the thing about the reporting on the Raiders. You know, sometimes I'll give sports scores in a newscast. Right. Right. And I always wonder now, do I still give the Raiders score? Because they're no longer a Bay Area team. Nope, they're not. Even though no matter where they move, they always seem to have a Bay Area based fan base. You oh know, yeah, but I mean, hell. I mean, but they left the Bay Area, they went to LA, they came right. back, they left for Las Vegas, and yet their fans are like, yes, Raiders in my blood. Like, really? Really? This yeah. team? Um, but yeah, I I mean it was so funny. You know, I put out, you know, F that team. I can't I can't stand them. And I, I mean it in jest, obviously I don't wish anybody harm, but no right. way as a Niner fan would I <laughs> ever ever go for the Raiders. So um yeah, that's just how I don't throw that out there. I'm like, support local. Maybe if they still were, but they're not. You know, uh you know how we always trade mom stories. Oh, it's time for news, isn't it? Yeah, but it's okay. Go ahead. I have a mom story. Well I and every everyone that mo- watches the Mark Thompson show knows this already. Okay. But I got an um, email today from Jacob's teacher. Praising saying, your son for being amazing, right? Uh yes and Oh, and but <laughs> apparently he got in trouble in PE for putting a kick me sign on a classmate. Well, multiple classmates. What is he in a sitcom? What the I, hell is that? A kick uh, me sign? Where did he get that idea? I well, and that's the thing is I know he wouldn't have done that mm-hmm. unless he'd seen someone else do it. Now, I'm not saying that's an excuse at all, but I don't think she has the only culprit here. I think he was just the one dumb enough to get caught. Uh, that is yeah. so silly. I mean, who does that anymore? I've never got seen to the office today for that. Yeah, what? So is he going to get 
punished? Well, I don't know what's going to, I don't think what's it's an appropriate punished. punishment mom for putting I a sticker sign on a student. I asked the teacher for the names of the students where he put stickers on mm -hmm. so that this afternoon we can talk about how that's not a way to treat people. How would he like it if someone put that sign on him? Mm -hmm. You know, would he feel like someone was being mean to him? And what if someone got kicked and got hurt? What if that, you know, really did happen? So he'll be writing apology notes to all the students that he did that to. How many students did he, how many kick me signs no did he make? It could be one or more. I have zero clue. Don't know. Don't know. Uh, Jacob, you're awesome. But don't do that. That's terrible. Terrible. No good. Very bad. Bad, 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 bad. But again, it just boggles my mind that somebody puts a, like a kick me sign. You would feel it instantly. Signs on the back. No, 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 no. I know, right? Like Calvin's like, check your back. <laughs> Do you ever get c calls from the principal that your kid has done something wrong? Is that, has that ever happened uh, to you? So my son, actually, when he was in elementary school, because he's in middle school now, uh, now, out of everybody in my household, I will say that my son probably has the biggest heart. He's the most empathetic. Mm -hmm. He is, it just, he, he's just that way. I'm not saying that we aren't, but he's just to an nth degree. Yeah. So I get a call from the principal. And, and now my son is shorter than other kids. I mean, we're a short family. I get a call from the principal that said that my son and some other kids were kind of getting into it. And my son, my shorter son, apparently body slammed another oh. kid up against a fence and I guess hit him in the stomach. Now- okay. I will be completely honest. When I was on the phone, I was like, my son's Dylan Lesser. Like, I was like, I was like, <laughs> like because there's a lot of Dylans in his class. Like, this, right. I'm like, do you have the right Dylan? And they're like, yes, this is the right Dylan. And I wow. go, I was like, okay. And so I had to go into the principal's office and, and kind of sit there. And apparently what happened was that these kids were kind of getting physical with my son and my son was kind of defending himself. So there was kind of fault on both sides, sure. but obviously they both needed to apologize and do those sorts of things. Yeah. Full disclosure, as the mom of a son that's smaller in stature and likely will be growing up, not that I ever want my son to lay his hands on anybody, but there is a message of, well, you have to defend yourself okay. if they are being physical with you. I do. I am not raising a kid that's just going to kind of take it and not try at least to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a weird type of lesson of we talk things through first. We notify the adults around us, those sorts of things. But if push comes to shove, kid, and you're getting pushed and shoved, don't just stand there. Yeah. Is that wrong? I mean, is that wrong? No, I don't think so, especially if uh, because of his stature. My child is like Bam Bam. <laughs> he looks, he's in third grade, but looks like he's in sixth grade. Right. He's, right, he's, right. Hum, he's a very, he's going to be really tall. He's going to be a big man. Right. And so for him, I think I need to teach him to be gentle with people. Be the gentle you giant. Know? That's right. So Defend others different. because people right. are going to probably back yeah. down if right. they see you coming, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's so hard though. Like we're on opposite ends of the spectrum, but I think the whole thing is the same is you want to avoid conflict as much as possible, right? Right, And then use whatever you have to the most uh, kind, gentle degree. But yeah. again, if you're getting picked on, I'm sorry. So Don't do just stand there, my friend. Just apology note, or you think I should do something else? We'll have a discussion. <laughs> I had the worst thought that just entered my head. I was like, well, you could put a kick me sign on him and then let your daughter <laughs> kick him in the butt and see how it would feel. No, no, no. <laughs> That's uh, no, probably bad. Yeah. How would it feel? Well, now you're going to know. We all get know. to kick you in the butt. And Line then up, would everyone. you want to do that? Then no. I mean, He's yeah, so he that really is, is a really, sweetheart. I want to know. You need to yeah. interrogate him and find out where that idea came from. Because again, yeah. I have never in 2023 heard of kick me signs being used. I mean, apparently it's still a thing at school. 
your son started it, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, guys. Uh, click that thumbs up button. Let us know what you think about the show. The Super Chat is live. Uh, if you want to donate some money that way. Of course, if you want to donate monthly and really help keep this show going, please visit our website, thenickymidoroshow.com. The Patreon link is there and you can donate any amount you want to. It really helps us out. PayPal donations as well for those of you that don't particularly want to do PayPal. Patreon. It's the Nikki Medora show at gmail.com. But again, during the show, the super chat is live. I'll give some shout outs after Kim's news. And again, support our exclusive founding sponsor, Steve Moskowitz, triple eight tax deal, Moskowitz, LLP.com. Here's Kim with some news. Now from around the world to up your street, the Nikki Medora show presents news czar Kim McAllister. And this report sponsored by tax attorney Steve Moskowitz at 888-TAX-DEAL. A memorial fundraiser for Tyree Nichols is climbing above $1 million. Nichols died earlier this month after being severely beaten by Memphis police after a traffic stop. His mother put together the fundraiser two days ago with plans to pay for mental health services and a memorial skate park in his name. Again, the fundraiser now above a million dollars. I think the goal she set was $1.2 million. The Senate Majority Leader believes that Democrats will get their way when it comes to the debt ceiling. Uh, this is an interview with Politico. Chuck Schumer of New York says the plan is to get House Republicans to understand that they are flirting with disaster by demanding spending cuts. Democrats would like to raise the borrowing limit quickly with no strings attached. Experts say banning gas stoves won't save the planet. Dan Cohen at Rice University says gas heaters are the biggest culprit of pollution. So instead of just focusing on kitchen appliances, he says there needs to be a larger debate really over uh, fossil fuels in general. And Russian President Vladimir Putin says uh, is accused of threatening a missile strike. Let me get that picture down because different story. Uh, threatening a missile strike he says, against a former British prime minister. Wow. In a BBC documentary, Boris Johnson recalled Putin saying it would only take a minute to hurt him with a missile during a call a year ago. A Kremlin spokesman, Dmitry Peskov, denied a threat was ever made. Nearly three dozen people, unfortunately, are dead following an attack, as many were praying at a mosque in Pakistan. This was a suicide bombing in the northwestern city of Peshawar. More than 100 people there are injured. The uh, completely, to just change it all up completely, the Hershey Bears hockey team is donating a record-breaking number of toys to Pennsylvania charities. The team didn't score against the Bridgeport Islanders Sunday, but fans threw more than 67,300 bears and other toy animals onto the rink. That is nearly 15,000 more that were, than were tossed during the tradition last year. So again, more than 60, 67,000 stuffed animals will be uh, donated in that, uh, in that case. There's a food service director being accused of stealing one and a half million dollars worth of chicken wings from a Chicago area school district. What are you going to do with that many chicken wings? I don't know. <clears throat> Vera Liddell accused of ordering more than 11,000 cases of wings from the district's <laughs> food provider before picking them up in a district cargo van. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, Super Bowl's coming and chicken wings are extremely popular, but did you say 11,000? Yes. Pounds? Yes. Of chicken wings. 11,000 cases. Oh my God. Of chicken wings. That's a lot more than 11,000 chicken wings. One and a half million dollars worth. Hmm. I mean, she doesn't have one hell of a Super Bowl party. Court I mean, what records the say the fraud began during the height of the pandemic when students were unable to attend classes in person. The theft <laughs> discovered during a mid-year audit when the district realized it was $300,000 over its food budget. Liddell currently in jail on a $150,000 bond. No word as to what happened to all those chicken wings. Oh, that's sad. Well... I mean, I, I would say, like, if they were a live chicken, you want to, like, rescue them. If they were eggs, they're, like, gold right now. But chicken wings? That many? She had hmm. to have sold them. I think so. Right? Probably, yeah. Don't you think? Probably, 
This report sponsored by tax attorney Steve Moskowitz for more than 30 years. Steve has put his tax knowledge to work for individuals and businesses. If you need help with your taxes, check in with Steve Moskowitz. He's at 888-TAX-DEAL. He's also at MoskowitzLLP.com. I'm Kim McAllister on The Nikki Maduro Show. I haven't filed a tax return in years. What should I do? Not filing a tax return for years isn't a surprisingly common problem. And the number one reason people don't file is just because they didn't have the money in year one and then year two runs around and then they say, well, how can I file year two if they didn't file year one and they still don't have the money? And then it becomes a lifestyle, a criminal-like lifestyle. The other reason is somebody depended on somebody, a spouse, a business partner, they're gone, they don't know what to do. The bottom line is we can get all of the records that the IRS and the state has on you We'll file all the returns that you need to file, no matter how many years it is. And then if you're the typical person and you just don't have the money to pay the taxes, that's okay. There's all kinds of good options for you. In almost all cases, we do everything for you. You don't have to talk to the government, deal with them, have anything to do with them. And don't stick your head in the sand because the IRS is hiring 87,000 new IRS agents and you don't want them knocking on your door. This is not legal advice, and you should consult with your tax attorney or professional. Thanks for joining us for the second hour of the Nikki Maduro show. And um, look, there were a number of news stories that were pretty heavy while I was off with my daughter uh, last week and kind of the week before. Uh, The first that I want to get into, of course, since I wasn't able to, uh, was, of course, the Tyree Nichols uh, beating and subsequent death. Um, I want you guys to tell me in the chat room if you watched the video. Kim, did you watch it? You're muted. I didn't watch it. I did not watch it either. Uh, I got it. I I mean, I watched like little After the George Floyd video, which I saw over and over and over Mm -hmm. again when I was sitting in a newsroom. Right. I know. I I believe. I get it. I know Mm -hmm. that the police, you know, that this man died at the hands of officers. Right. I don't know what happened before that. I'm happy to read the recap. Right. Uh, but I don't want the images. I don't need it. Yeah. Uh, I didn't watch it for the exact same reason. Um, there, there was this article. And, and, I, and I think the reason why I'm, I'm asking this question is because it kind of hit home a little bit. Because I was thinking the same thing. You know, uh, and, and we'll also get into the Paul Pelosi thing as well. These body cam videos have mm-hmm. changed how the public understands police interactions. I understand the need to have these body cam videos. I understand that George Floyd's death probably would not have um, led to any sort of arrest without the cell phone video and all those sorts Mm -hmm. of things. So I believe there is a a purpose and a need for these videos. But my question is a simpler one. Do we, as the average American citizen, need to watch it to be outraged? Does your... Um, level of caring about what's going on? Does your level of comprehension about what is going on with policing in this country, does it necessitate seeing the video? Um, the reason why I didn't see it is, is one, being in the news business, even being a reporter, I have seen way more dead bodies and, and people being beaten than I ever would ever want to in a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you get sent out on stories, whether it's a car accident or a murder or whatever, uh, it stays with you. So if I have a choice, like my news director isn't sending me to cover something, if I have a choice not to view it, I make it, right? Because I don't want to add to the images and the experience that I already have. On the other hand, do we have a responsibility to look at this horror in its face and understand fully what is going on. Uh, Then there's a New York Times article by A.O. Scott, a simple headline, the responsibility of watching 
And it says the video of Memphis police beating Tyree Nichols challenges public complacency and complicity. What are our duties as citizens and as human beings? Uh, A.O. Scott writes in this one part, he says, the hope is that concerned Americans will become witnesses after the fact. Our senses mm -hmm. shocked and our consciences awakened by the sight of uniformed officers repeatedly kicking and punching Mr. Nichols, who would die from his injuries three days later. The police chief quoted as saying, I expect you to feel what the Nichols family feels. And her appeal to common humanity expressed faith in the power of even the most horrific images to foster empathy and community. But does it? Do you feel like videos such as this are moving this country in a direction in which we will see fewer of these police beatings happening? There was a time at which many people would say, that didn't really happen. That guy deserved it. Right. The police don't do that. You must have been doing something wrong. This is all this other guy's fault. Police don't do this. this uh, they, the point is, you get the point, uh, is that there are people that wouldn't believe it. Right. Because how shocking is that? That, right. And I understand why they didn't believe it. First of all, they don't come often from a place where they're continually targeted. So for them, it's hard to kind of put their mindset in the fact that this actually happens. And then, you know, they, there's a belief system that we have that the people in power won't abuse that power. You know, we make you a police officer. We give you a gun. We say that you're serving the community and we expect you to be the good guys, right? Well, then comes the video. I know we've seen other videos, but for me, this is the video that hit it, was the George Floyd video with the boot on the neck. Now, I don't know how many times you could have said that as far as uh, they, this didn't really happen. The guy must have deserved it. And then see that video and not have understood, oh, maybe I've been thinking about this in incorrectly. Maybe th there is something to this. Maybe there is such a thing as police brutality. Mm -hmm. So I think that for me, videos have served their purpose. I. Yeah. I, if I didn't get it before, I got it then. I, I got it before. But you know, right. you see what I'm saying? Exactly. So I feel like if you're still someone who doesn't get it, then maybe these videos are important for you to watch. That, that I will say. Because right. I agree with a, a chat that I saw just a few minutes ago uh, that said something about we need these videos to change sensibilities. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's more important. Your sensibility is not as important as societal change. Right. That's true, uh, unless you're a person that's already on board with societal change, in which case, why do you need to keep beating up your heart? Right. Um, yeah. I mean, there was a protest yesterday in Oakland. There's been protests around the country. Uh, this morning on The View, Whoopi Goldberg posed an interesting question that I think we've all kind of asked ourselves. So here again, uh, was uh, kind of the opening of the topic on the view. When will the brutality finally lead to some police reform from the ground up? Because clearly, it doesn't matter if it's a white policeman or a black policeman, it is a problem in the police, in the policing yes. itself, mm -hmm. you know. Seems things don't seem to make sense to people unless it's somebody they can feel or they can mm -hmm. recognize. But how many times do we have to, do we need to see white people also get beaten before anybody will do anything? I'm not suggesting that. So don't write us and tell me what a, you know, what a racist I am. I'm just asking, is that, is that what people have to see in order to wake up and realize this affects us all? Exactly. I would is like there... to think not. But it, but there's a disconnect, Kim, obviously in this country, right? With George Floyd, people were making excuses about the man, his criminal history, as mm -hmm. if that justified that yep. cop murdering him in front of a crowd of people. No. See, we make up these, in my opinion, we make up these stories to make ourselves feel okay with what I think we know deep down is an injustice and is a crime against somebody. And yet because somebody wears a badge 
other emotions get tied into it because we're talking about men and women who say and who take an oath to protect and serve and then don't. Um, it, it, it evokes emotions and contradictions in how we should view said people. I have said this before. I have said this over and over, especially since George Floyd. I do believe there's more good cops than bad, but I think the silence within those good cops and in that, that group of people is what is ruining relations in this country. I mm -hmm. wish that if there were protests on the streets over the beating of George Floyd or Tyree Nichols or so many other people, that officers would be in those protests as well because they would want to end what is a growing stereotype or a possible truth about policing in this country. Where are these officers when these protests are happening? Where are they speaking out against the men and women that may have stood next to them, you know, while they became police officers and saying, I'm not that kind of cop. And I'm going to call out the injustice and I'm going to call out the crime because I did take an oath to protect and serve every single person. Mm -hmm. I am not judge, jury, and executioner. <clears throat> I am a person that wants to make people feel safe. And I just wish that I was seeing and hearing more from the police community instead of a pushback of, oh, well, this person did this and this person was behaving in this way. You are supposed to let our system work. You should learn better de-escalations and it shouldn't mm -hmm. have to be, oh, until a white person is beaten to a pulp that something is done about it. John Radley says, <clears throat> I didn't watch the video either. A lot of people yeah. have said that. And I just, I wonder, do you think that not watching the video means that we don't have an accurate picture and our finger on the pulse of what's happening in our own country? even if we know that there's police brutality, do you think people like you and I and everyone in the chat here has a duty to watch that video? A duty, no. Um, and I'm not going to watch the video. Uh, the reason I'm not watching the video is just echoing what you said before. I know what's on the video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sadly, I've seen that video already. I have seen a man crumpled on the ground getting beaten. We saw it mm -hmm. with Rodney King. We've seen it so many times. We've seen it throughout history, right? We have mm -hmm. seen brutality of those in power against those that have no power in that situation. The difference, of course, in our generation is the cameras and, 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 and how many cameras are catching so many instances of this happening that all of a sudden it doesn't seem to be a one-off it doesn't just happen to be the rodney king beating oh remember the rodney king beating it's like do you remember last week's beating and two days ago's beating that's what it's becoming it's like school shootings or mass shootings right it's like oh which one what day what year right oh the one what last month or the one the month before that that's the sadness that's the sickness that's happening in this country well and, and i don't know what we do that's what I wonder is if by not watching the video, which I've also chosen to not do by not watching the video, is it allowing ourselves not to have this escalating anger that leads to change? Right. Because we know what we say, we know what's on the video. We do, right. but there's something that happens when you see that beating, when you mm. watch that person die needlessly and get beaten to a pulp needlessly you watch that injustice happen there's an anger that happens an escalation that happens and so i wonder are at the at the uh, uh by protecting our our heart and our souls from seeing that horribleness are we not participating in that kind of escalation of that leads to change that we need to does yeah. that make sense? I, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. I just, I don't feel that it's necessarily needed. And I will add this also. I think it can be exploited, right? I think that, uh, and not to, you know, knock our own profession, but news agencies, click, social media, you know, it, it's one of those things where are you sharing this video because you, you're trying to get through to someone who may not uh, mm -hmm. be on the same page as those of us who understand what's going on out there? Or are you doing it for the clicks and the likes and the, you know, all of that sort of thing? And right. if it's that, then that's just ugly and dirty and exploiting somebody's life uh, who didn't who didn't deserve to lose their life so, so young. And then, of course, there is the whole conversation regarding not just policing, 
but with race relations and, and power structures and, and how policing was even set up in this country and talking about the history of things as they are now and how they were before that led to how it is now. Um, Bill Maher, who I'm, I'm not a fan of, who apparently, by the way, is going to be moved on to CNN because of the merger with Discovery or some crap. But anyways, there's going to be more Bill Maher around. Um, he had Brian Cranston, the actor, uh, on his show. Um, I'm going to play you just a little bit of a clip. And, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to equate necessarily uh, police beatings, because, again, these police officers, uh, I believe all of them were black. I know a sixth one has just been relieved of duty. I don't know the race of that person, but no. he was white. OK, so but m most of the officers that beat Tyree Nichols were black. So obviously it is policing like Whoopi Goldberg was talking about. So the sixth officer relieved of duty either yesterday or today, recently, most mm. recently, was apparently, his lawyer says he was not there at the time of the beating. So he didn't necessarily, this is what I understand, participate in the beating, but in the initial stop can be heard on the tape saying some pretty rotten things. Oh, uh, was that, I hope they stomp him conversation? Mm -hmm, was that yeah. him? Oh, mm -hmm. well, there you go. Uh, again, the mentality of people in power when you know you have the upper hand from the get-go. And again, what led us here? Can we ignore what has happened in our history that led us here? I say no. Bill Maher apparently thinks so. So here's just a little bit, and it's much longer, and I wanted to pull all of it, but it would have been way too long, and I can only handle Bill Maher's voice for so long. <laughs> um, but he brings up the topic of CRT. Okay, right, so it can mean it's... I mean, it's just one of these catch-all terms. If you mean we should honestly teach our past, of course. If you mean more what the uh, 1619 book says, which is that it's just the essence of America and that we are irredeemable, that's just wrong. It's yeah. not. I mean, okay. yeah, right. I, I, I agree with that. But even even teaching our past and being honest and owning up to who we are as a country in the history of most schools are doing that. I'm, I'm sure there are ones in Texas that are not. Uh, Florida. In Florida, they're, they're, they 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 want to do do away with critical race theory in a lot of other states. Because, some, because sometimes it veers off into things that are really not appropriate in schools. So how do you govern you, that? If you're how telling you... five-year-olds that you're either an oppressor or someone who uh, was uh, oppressed, you're, you're introducing ideas about race that are inappropriate for, for kids that age who can't understand okay, it. Okay, so common sense would Common sense that. is what's lacking in yeah. this country. You need to, That's yeah. why, but that is why people wind up passing laws about that. And yes, you're right, very often the laws go too far. But it's not coming out, it's not coming from nothing. It's coming from things that have started in colleges mm. and very far left woke thinking that uh, many people feel is not appropriate in schools. I mean, the same thing with, with gender stuff. You know, can they just be kids for a minute? And that last line is what gets me so angry. Because what do we also know, Bill Maher, is that the young kid that just lost his father, is he too young? to understand that his dad was beaten by police officers? Who's gonna explain it to him? Do we not tell him? Because he's only four. And so obviously the world is made of rainbows and butterflies and there's no police beatings. No, that kid is old enough, right? He's now old enough to learn all the situation involving the death of his father, but he's just a little black boy who's lost his, his, his father at the hands of police. But we're not gonna bring up that conversation. And then when that kid goes to school and sits in the classroom, and knows that his father was beaten to death by police. And they're like, oh, police officers are our friends. This kid's not going to have any questions because ah, it's a little too young to bring up race relations in the classroom. See, Bill Maher and people like him forget that there's actually a real world that children of all ages are part of. And if you don't think a three-year-old who sees racism against their parents doesn't understand what the hell is going on, you're mistaken. And you might want to shield the other little white kids who just don't have any experience with this and so don't want to be called an oppressor because they're not, and I'm not calling them that. But to say that racism is not ingrained in our country is a fallacy that Bill Maher is living in never, never land. 
and it's wrong and he is part of the problem and i wonder if he watched that video and was still defending all of this and saying you know the past is the past and we can't learn anything by dwelling on it anymore i just don't believe that kindergarten teachers tell five-year-olds you're either the oppressor <sighs> exactly. or not. Exactly. I just, it doesn't. They'll find one teacher saying anything remotely close to it, and that is happening all over the I country. Just That's what they say. I feel like that, that is a scare tactic and a talking point that anyone who has been volunteered in a, a kindergarten class or observed it for any moment knows that te kindergarten teachers aren't those people. Exactly. Kindergarten teachers are very special people. They deal with four and five, six-year-old children like uh, like they're magic. It's a mm -hmm. magical place, and they're not going to do that. I just, no. I don't buy it. No, exactly. I don't. I don't buy it either. And I just, and I feel like, you know, and I know he has a show to put on, and and he has a reputation of saying certain no. things, and, and that's why I don't watch his show, because sometimes I feel like he, he doesn't even listen to the words that are coming out of his own mouth. But this idea... That kids are too young to learn things, obviously at an appropriate level using appropriate language. But to say, oh, four and five year olds, they don't need to learn about racism, as if they've never experienced it themselves, is right. naive at uh, the very least and insulting at the very most. Because these kids know the world they live in, right? They know the world they live in. And just to ignore that, to protect, hmm, to protect who? To protect people that are not being oppressed. Those parents aren't being largely beaten by police, right? I'm not saying crimes don't happen against all races and I'm not saying that, so don't get on me about that, but you know what I'm saying. So no, it's it just, hmm. it's to me, it's a, when you think of critical race theory, I think of it as just teaching kids what really happened, right? Yeah, being but honest about it. A family member who is a Fox News uh, subscriber watcher and thinker uh -huh. uh, says oh no you know they're teaching these kids to not like themselves they're teaching <sighs> they're teaching all the white kids to feel guilty that's what this is all about they want pe white kids to feel bad right but, i mean well who doesn't feel bad if you learn that your you know race of people that look like you were the ones that brought people here on ships there is a moment where you're like you say, we did that. We did that to people? Mm -hmm. Like we white people did that to people? Mm -hmm. It's okay to feel bad about that for a second until you realize it wasn't me. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that way. We're better than that. And we can do better than that. Mm -hmm. And we can treat people equally. So, you know, I, I just, I feel like it's not about making people feel guilty, although no. that may come naturally. It's about teaching what really happened. And if that makes you feel guilty, then okay. Then sit with it. You know what I mean? Like, why do I identify with the oppressor? Why do I Why do I identify with the slave master? Why do I identify so much that I'm offended? Why don't I identify with those that, that stood and marched right along with yeah. Black people? Why are you not identifying with those white people? See, mm -hmm. you have to sit with it. And aren't five-year-olds sitting with it? No. Uh, Calvin, I think, was uh, had a great... I don't think slavery, civil war was taught until middle school. No, it was taught way earlier than that. Um, yeah. My I mean, kids know. My kids know. And they, they were mm -hmm. taught definitely in elementary school because that's when I was volunteering in my kids' classroom. We learned about uh, Rosa Parks. We learned about the Underground Railroad. Yeah. I mean, all of these Martin sorts Luther of King things. Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Yeah. Jr. Yeah. I mean, these, these lessons start young as they should not telling not looking at every white kid being like you're an oppressor nobody's freaking doing that and then somebody else was saying it's a fox news right-wing talking point you're absolutely correct yeah. um but they have to do it to get people enraged so these fox news watchers will go to thanksgiving dinner and start railing about you know how they're now being oppressed and all yeah. this sort of nonsense and it just it, it doesn't help the situation it doesn't help the conversation um and I do think that while I won't watch the Tyree Nichols video, um, I, I still feel like I am a huge voice uh, for those that want to improve policing in this country. I think you need to lend your voice to that. And I call on anyone within the law enforcement community, anyone within the law enforcement community to pick up a microphone, a megaphone, march, because if it's not you, 
but you stay silent, it might as well be. It might as well be. Because you have a unique position being within a police department to call out your brothers and sisters who are not right, who are wrong. And, and, and that's where it has to start. It's not going to start with us on the outside of, of law enforcement. It has to start within. Uh, okay, we're going to do some news. Um you know, I, I want to just touch on that Paul Pelosi tape as well, but not to mm -hmm. delve too much into it. But you guys can tell me in the chat. I'll leave you with this question. Why did they show it on the news? I decided um, not to. I well, decided okay. not to show it here, but I did pull pictures from it. Okay. But I didn't um, want to roll the whole, whole video. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a story when we come back because I did watch it mm -hmm. by accident. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to show it. So you guys tell me, I mean, do you think that, you know, moving away from Tyree Nichols to Paul Pelosi in a more general term, do you think police body cam videos in its entirety, maybe even cut up, but showing kind of the crime are necessary and are news? You guys tell me again, click the thumbs up button. Let us know what you think about the show. Uh, you could throw us some money in the super chat. We really appreciate it. I'm going to actually give some shout outs right now because I wanted to do it before. Jim Slayton, who I was showing off earlier today. Did I, <laughs> do, were you here already when I showed you the picture? So Jim Slayton uh, comes in with a $5 super sticker. Look, look at Jim Slayton. Look what he's wearing. Oh, how cute is he? He's got the Mark Burt beanie okay. and the Nikki Maduro show t-shirt. That's Look my at guy. that. That's well our guy done. right there. Thank you. Thank you. And also for the $5 super sticker, you That's guys are great. amazing for donating. Of course, Andreas, who I'm hoping things are better with your mom, Andreas. $20 donation. Yeah. She is We're better. She's recovered, he says. Okay, so this good. Is so good. Good, good, good. Yeah. Oh, I'm so happy to hear mm -hmm. that. We've been following closely, and I just I appreciate you guys all so much. Another yeah. $20 from Andreas. Oh, oh, yes. Good luck to the 49ers. So kind. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, if you want some merchandise and be cool like Jim Slayton was, you can go to the Nikki Maduro shop.com. The Nikki Maduro shop.com. I did have some other pictures I wanted to show real quickly. Um, here was, and I don't think you caught them. David with a cup. Awesome. Thank you, David. Yes, indeed, indeed. And again, we have uh, have, pretty eyes. We have uh, hoodies. Um, someone bought it. I felt like I mentioned it when I first um, launched these that you should probably go a size up of what you are. I know that was true for the t-shirts, for the hoodies as well. Somebody said that they bought it, but again, go a size up was their recommendation. We have AirPods for both pro and regular, and we have the black sweatshirt as well with the red uh radio tower in it as well so thank you thank you thank you to everybody that is supporting the show in that way and and you can go to the nikki maduro shop.com is the best way to get your hands on some merchandise and show your love for the show all right let's do some news now from around the world to up your street the nikki maduro show presents news czar kim McAllister. and this report is sponsored by tax attorney steve moskowitz at 888 tax deal. So let us begin with the, you can kind of see, this is the Potomac Tunnel. Uh, and what we know today is that a major project funded by the bipartisan infrastructure law to replace the Baltimore and Potomac Tunnel is now being touted by President Biden. The 150-year-old tunnel runs Amtrak trains between Washington, D.C. and New York City. It is considered to be the largest rail bottleneck on the Northeast Corridor. While speaking in Baltimore, President Biden said his infrastructure law will contribute more than $4 billion to rebuild this rundown tunnel. And the migrant crisis in South Florida is now catching the eye of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. He pointed to the new parole process for Cubans, Haitians, Venezuelans, and Nicaraguans announced in January uh, the re-implementation of the Migration Accords and the Cuban Family Reunification Program. Mayorkas also met with Miami-Dade County's mayor and Haitian and Cuban leaders in making that announcement. It turns out that children in school during the pandemic, apparently are losing out on about a third of what they would have learned. A study in the journal Nature Human Behavior proves there are long-term consequences left by COVID despite new tools like effective vaccines. Kids just didn't get that stuff that they should have gotten in school, a third of what they should have learned. 
and SpaceX is set to launch tomorrow a Falcon 9 rocket from California. The launch was supposed to happen at Vandenberg Space Force Base Sunday morning, but it got delayed until Monday. Now it's been pushed till Tuesday morning as a launch window opens after uh, 8 o'clock Pacific time. The payload is another set of 49 Starlink internet satellites that will be sent into low Earth orbit. I just like to celebrate uh, this man. Whenever I see a story about him pop through, he has uh, lived for quite a long time and he's lived quite a life. This is the oldest living U.S. veteran to survive the attack on Pearl Harbor. He is about to mark a major milestone. His name is Joseph Eskenazi. He was an army private stationed in Hawaii when the Japanese attacked December 7th, 1941. And today, He turns 105 years old. So happy birthday, Mr. Eskenazi. Coco, the beloved Disney Disney tearjerker, one of my favorite Disney movies. Love this one. It's headed to Broadway now. The Pixar film, which won 2018 Oscars for Best Original Song, Remember Me, and Best Animated Feature is now Broadway bound. We don't know when because Disney hasn't said that yet, but The news about Coco came during a recent performance at Epcot's Epcot's International Festival of the Arts. The movie features, of course, a 12-year-old boy named Miguel who is accidentally transported to the land of the dead. He seeks help from his great-great-grandfather, a deceased musician, on finding his way home and lifting the family's ban on music. So, Broadway bound for Coco. This report sponsored by tax attorney Steve Moskowitz. For more than 30 years, Steve has put his tax knowledge to work for all the people. Whether you're filing individually, whether you're married, you've got a business, whatever your situation, Steve Moskowitz can help you out. He's at 888-TAX-DEAL. He's also at MoskowitzLLP.com. I'm Kim McAllister on The Nikki Maduro Show. Thank you, Kim. Okay, I do want to lighten things up towards the end of the show, but I want to get into the Paul Pelosi thing and share the story of how I accidentally watched the video. So I was in the hospital with my daughter and I honestly, in the mornings, it was just, it was a constant flood of doctors and nurses constantly coming in. I didn't get to watch that much news because in the morning on TV, I caught it online and stuff like that. But I was like, oh, let me turn on the news. What channel? I want to say it was Cron. I think I'm going to call him out, but it could have been any of them. But I think it was Cron. Cron 4. Yeah, I'm almost positive. So like, oh, uh, the body count fo- footage of Paul Pelosi has been, no, has been released. Now I'm sitting in a room with my 13-year-old daughter. And I'm like just watching the news. Mm-hmm. I don't know, 8 o'clock in the morning, whatever. And all of a sudden, like you see the body count footage, which was really an odd kind of interaction. I don't know if you guys have really talked about it. But, you know, Paul Pelosi is kind of standing there with this hand on this hammer that the other guy's also having but they're just kind of standing there yeah like kind of standing there and then the cop's like what's up you know and then all of a sudden like the guy tries to start pulling the hammer away and paul's trying to paul pelosi's trying to grab it and then all of a sudden the guy just reaches up and like goes and i'm you know me and I like my scary movies. I screamed. I was like, oh my God. And right then my daughter's doctor comes in. And so she thinks something's wrong with my daughter. Oh God. And my, and Marley was even like, oh my God. Like we're both just looking at it. And I I, I turn the TV off and, I'm, and, and she's like, oh my God, is everything okay? And I go, no, we're just watching the news. And I felt, now again, I like my scary movies and it's not as if we saw the actual hit, but I mean, yeah. I mean, it went off camera for a second. Yeah. I think that was completely unnecessary. I don't think that they should have shown it like that on the news in the morning. Um, I'm often not one of those people that is like, oh, protect the children type of thing. Like parents should know what their kids are watching. But I was completely Mm -hmm. surprised. I I did not expect that to happen. They say something beforehand, like this is a graphic, whatnot. Maybe. I I, I might not have caught it. It was just kind of like, yeah, possibly, probably, probably. So I watched the whole video and it, most of it is the police wandering around the outside. Right. And you can hear something. And then when they open the door, the two men, Mr. Pelosi and uh, the suspect to to pape Mm -hmm. look over 
but it's not until, and I'll show the picture again, it's not until they shine the light, you can see the, the flashlight, mm -hmm. that almost to me seemed to, to escalate everything. Like once the light was shined and all of a sudden, then the swing happened and they went behind the door and it was over within seconds. Ugh. I mean, it just... But I'm not it, showing that video because... Yeah, I was just surprised that it was being shown like that. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, back to body cam videos in general, what is the purpose of it? Um, now, did I pull it? I don't think I Nancy pulled Pelosi, it. Nancy Pelosi, by the way, said she's not watching that. Yeah, I would not either. Oh, are you kidding me? Oh, hell no. She's like, I've already seen the damage. I've seen what happened. I've seen the aftermath. I saw him in the hospital. I don't need to right. see how the attack went down. Yeah. You saw this, right? I mean, did you hear? And I don't know if you did this on Friday, because I think it happened on Friday, where DePape called Amber Lee with KTVU. Uh, let me show you a little bit. And, and our thanks to KTVU and Amber Lee, because she had this exclusive. He called her. So here we go. Oh. Can't hear it. Oh, where's the volume? Here we go. There we here go. after his arrest. At the start of our conversation this afternoon, he told me he wanted to make a statement and that I could recall the call. Drop the hammer. Um, nope. This body cam video of David DePap attacking Paul Pelosi, the husband of former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, was released Friday morning by the San Francisco DA's office. Prosecutors say it shows DePap holding a hammer as police responded to a 911 call from the Pelosi home in Pacific Heights. DePap strikes Pelosi in the head, knocking him to the floor. Hours later, I received a phone call from DePap while I was in the KTVU newsroom. Now that y'all have seen the body cam footage, I have an important message for everyone in America. You're welcome. You're welcome. Your liberty isn't dying, it's being killed, systematically and deliberately. The people killing it have names and addresses. So I got their names and addresses so I could pay them a little visit. I have a heart-to-heart -heart chat about their bad behavior. DePap offers an apology, not for the attack that seriously injured Pelosi and left him hospitalized for several days with a fractured skull. The apology was for what he says he didn't get to do. I want to apologize to everyone. I messed up. What I did was really bad. I'm so sorry. I didn't get more of them. It's my own. I'm so sorry. I did not get more of them. Where is Fox News on all of this, by the way? That was making fun. Remember, Elon Musk even came out with an apology. Yeah. For calling Paul Pelosi and Nancy Pelosi that this was all made up. Um, I'm horrified that this happened, but the fact that, well, one, this guy, what he, he's, um, uh, he's in the country illegally from Canada. Why does Canadians, why does this Canadian care about Paul Pelosi or Nancy Pelosi or our government here in the United States? Why? The only reason I could think of is because of the conspiracies that are being spewed through these things. And so then I go back to, do, do videos like this, does information like this help or hurt the conversation and stop people like this from doing what they did? I, I, I don't know. I'm just seeing that video over and over again and then seeing the, the horrible- Hearing what he said. he said? Yeah, that's awful. I just don't, I mean, I, 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 on one hand, as a news person, I know it's important. On the other hand, I don't want to give that type of uh, attitude, that type of uh, thought, uh, any credence in this world, because there's other creeps that will stand up and say, yeah, what he said. And all of a sudden they're knocking at everybody's door. I just, I, yeah, I just, I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to hear from that guy. I, he's crazy. Someone in the chat wrote, I wouldn't hate to be that guy's lawyer. Oh, yes. God. Being Mr. DePap's lawyer, although I suppose you could make the case just by showing that video that he is a mentally deficient and that he probably isn't well, they all have to trial be. because he's cray cray, right? Well, so, his uh, his defender, his public defender said the body cam footage, uh, this is rich, is disrespectful to Paul Pelosi uh, and could spark unfounded theories about the case, jeopardizing DePap's ability to get a fair trial. Well, 
I, I mean, I think that it's disrespectful that your client did what he obviously did to Paul Pelosi. It's caught on camera. But I don't understand what is causing this. And, and it is all in this idea of, I didn't, I, I saw the video. We've all seen the video. We don't want to see the video. But does it help or does it hurt? Does it give, like you were mentioning, Kim, the wackadoos that think like DePape does mm -hmm. more credence, more, oh, let's go after that guy. Or does it show the rest of us like, you're nuts. We have to do something about this. We have to we have to stamp down or tamp down mm -hmm. this type of rhetoric because it leads to th stuff like this. Why the hell? Yeah, why the hell does someone from Canada care so much? And the only thing I could think of is because they have gone down the rabbit hole of conspiracy and everything else that led to stuff like January 6th and, 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 and similar instances. By the way... I would feel the same way about this person and this case. Were it someone I truly don't like, let's say former President Trump. That oh, God, yeah. Came out I don't want to see that. I don't want to see him hurt. I don't want to see Mr. Pelosi hurt. I don't want to see anyone physically attacked for what they believe, what they don't believe, what you believe. Nothing. No one deserves an, uh, to be physically harmed like that. And so uh, for me, this goes way past any type of partisan politics at all. I just, uh, I just don't feel, I don't know. I, I just don't want to see anything bad happen to anybody else. And I feel of like course. sometimes when we, when we play stuff like that, uh, and I know Amber Lee had to report on that and she had to, to come out and say what he said, but I just don't want any other crazies coming out of the woodwork. Oh, uh, there's so many, there is so mm -hmm. many. Now, apparently there was a good question. Where was it? Uh, Beth asked who gave him that phone number uh, to Amber Lee? Cause he called her apparently. Uh, and sorry, the volume wasn't working at the time. She said, I had reached out to him a year last year after the mm -hmm. incident to try to get an interview or what have you. And so that's why. Um, but again, you know, I feel like if this guy's skin was a bit darker, if he came from the other border versus this border, the rhetoric on Fox News would have been completely oh. different, right? Yes. Yes. So where's the outrage? Yeah. Oh, and again, see, it's the hypocrisy yeah. of it all. It's just the hypocrisy. Yeah. No, I think of you're right. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, again, I think that the body cam footage serves a purpose. I'm just not sure. I don't. I don't know if all of us need it. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if all of us need it. And maybe Mindy's right. Maybe the media is making it worse. Maybe I'm making it worse. Maybe having these conversations is making it worse. But at the same time, we have to have these conversations. We can't ignore what's happening, mm -hmm. not just with race relations and police brutality, but our politics is getting all wrapped into this whole entire thing. We have to do something about it. We have to figure it out. Yeah, mental illness is one thing, uh, the lady Beatrice writes. Using it as a crutch is another. He needs help. Uh, yeah, I just don't know what kind of help uh, he's going to get. Um, okay, well, you know, kind of in the same vein, but to kind of lighten it up just in the last few minutes that we have, you know, obviously we're on social media now, we're on YouTube. Uh, the news is one thing. But did you see that the U.S. Surgeon General has now listed an age as being too young for social media? And it's 13 years old. Okay. So Vivek Murthy, I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Uh, he has come out and said that 13 year olds are too young for social media. Now, does this mean 14 is old enough? No, he is saying the parents should stand together and say that not until a kid is 16 or 17 years old, mm -hmm. they get 16, 17 or 18 is uh, whatever age they should choose, just not 13 and younger. Question for you, and I love that Al Anonymous <laughs> is saying this. Is it possible? And do you think all social media is bad? Maybe we'll continue this discussion uh, so we can get into it longer tomorrow. But do you think that 16 is, is an okay age for social media, Kim? Mm, <clears throat> I'm going to go higher. Oh, okay. 18? Uh, but I feel like, like being a teenager, as we all know, is hard it's enough. Hard. Yeah. We all went through the trials and tribulations with friendships and not being included or, you know, having someone's feelings be heard or whatever it may have been. And now you throw social media into the mix. You have bullying on social media. 
You have people feeling feeling isolated on social media, like they're not included. And the, there have been studies that have shown, and I wish I had time to pull it up so I could show you and quote them uh, appropriately, <clears throat> that specifically girls that have mm. access to social media in their tween and teen years have higher incidences of depression and suicide. Yep. So we know that, right? Why would we ever give them access to it? Right. Why would we do it? My kid asks me, a 13-year-old daughter, she asks me for Insta. I want Instagram. Yeah, no, my daughter's not on Instagram. She wants to be on social media because that's how kids are connecting. That's how they're communicating with each other. But if I know that these other bad outcomes are a possibility, then I my answer to her is they can text you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and texting used to be the the thing, right? Being on your phone too much, texting with your friends. Remember when you used to have to pay per text? Oh my God. Um, I mean, you think one of these, you know, everyday photo apps is okay. Like take a picture of yourself at a certain time every day. Oh, I know. I was a promoter of that. Yes. And then what you have is, you know, of a group of friend group of six girls Four are invited to go to whatever and get their picture taken together and post it on the thing. And the two others are feeling sad. Yeah. And that's not necessarily my daughter that is, you know, the one left out, or it might be whatever the case. But you're creating a sadness. I have a responsibility to make sure that that other kid doesn't feel bad. It's the reason they tell you at school, please don't bring your birthday invitations to school. Oh, yeah. I know. Because you're, you know, you're leaving people out. not invited. You're leaving people out. We don't want that at school. So I feel as a parent, it's my responsibility too, to not give my kids social media. So that person's kid doesn't feel poorly and bad. I don't want them to be depressed or suffer anxiety or depression or isolation. How are you going to teach your kids? How are you going to teach your kids uh, safe social media behavior then? Are you just going to be like at 18, you'll be able to figure it out? No. Um, so interestingly, and you probably know this about Girl Scouts, they mm-hmm. have had a uh, good digital citizen classes. And so Julia already supposedly, although she has made mistakes, already knows how a good digital citizen acts, that we don't say bad things on the internet, that we watch what we say, that we don't say hurtful things to people, that we don't give out our personal information over the internet, right. all these things that they've taught you. And hopefully... I feel like part of it uh, comes from what I'm teaching her about how just to be a person. Mm. Because who you are and how you treat people in person shouldn't be any different than how you do it online. Yeah. Um, I think that you're absolutely correct. I I, I love that you brought up the Girl Scouts because we did go through that whole Mm -hmm. uh, digital citizenship kind Mm -hmm. of badge, right? You, You could do all of these things. Of course, you know, being taught something and then applying it in every single situation is difficult, whether it's on social media, whether it's face to face, whether it's at school. Um, I feel like on one hand, you're right. I think that social media, the dangers of it make it not worth it. On the other hand, I know people uh, who are very close friends of mine who actually worry on the other end that their child is feeling left out because they're not on social media and that they've lost some sort of social skill that like it or not is here to stay at least in this generation that's Mm -hmm. the way they communicate and so they're worried that their kid is either being left out anyway or not developing the skills that they have i just want to say obviously it's on a case by case you know your kid the best sure um but i also think that there's there's good points of social media even for Mm -hmm. teenagers that can't be ignored the other stuff the depression, the suicide, the numbers when you read them are staggering. Mm-hmm. All that is more concerning to me and more important to me than the fact that they have to text her instead of Instagramming her. Right. I just right. feel like I'm not willing to go there. And if I can avoid her having a uh, some type of mental issue, then why wouldn't I try to do that? Right, right. Um, of course. I think any parent would want to do anything to protect their kids from feeling or at least not introducing any other kind of angst or problem. 
Uh, Al Anonymous writes, I miss flip phones and T9 texting. <laughs> drama exposure minimized. iPhone yeah. and apps for all kids made drama exposure go from faucet drip of social angst to a firehouse of exposure. Put them in sports. I mean, the put them in sports if they're into sports, I guess, is an yeah. answer. Um, but yeah, I would say we can't ignore the texting led to this, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, sharing photos, videos. Right. That came all before the apps anyway. Yeah. Um, those things were always there. I think phones right. in general are the problem. Yeah. Uh, and it's very hard to not have. And, and I'm guilty of it. I mean, I think most parents, if you're being honest, have been guilty of, of, of giving, you know, your kid access to something they're not supposed to have access to. Mm -hmm. And you have to read the, the, the room. Well, but there was that whole thing. Wait till eight. Right. right that we're not grade. supposed to give right. our kid a phone until eighth grade. That we, if we could just hold out that long. Right. Wait till eight, then they're they're more responsible to have it. A lot of people couldn't hold out that long, mm -hmm. so I agree. Uh, uh, you know, if you want to say wait till sixteen for social media, whatever. But I also agree with you that all kids are different. I have a sixteen-year-old niece. She doesn't care about her phone. She doesn't yeah. care about social media. And the only reason that she has Instagram or whatever, Twitter, what whatever, is because uh, <clears throat> she's a rower. And colleges recruit you by looking at your social media. See, and, so and they shouldn't do her, that. It's about that's sports. Wrong. So she has a sports profile, whatever, and she's already. And that's all that's on it. Yeah. And that's all that's on it. And that's that pretty is good. Good. But that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So a kid that, you know, she has her, if she doesn't ever have her phone in her hand. Yeah. My kid, since she's gotten her phone, hasn't put it down. So. I think you know what kind of a kid you have, you know? Right, exactly. And I do want to say, and I think that there are some, it matters who you follow. It matters mm -hmm. how you behave on social media. I just want to end on this kind of uplifting story because I've heard of this guy. I've actually heard him more because he partnered with a food critic that's been in the news a lot lately, Keith Lee. I don't know if you follow him on social media. He visits local restaurants, uh, mom and pops that are struggling. And then visits them and rates their food one to 10 to see if it's the food, customer service, or the marketing that's the problem. He's blown up. He's probably going to get his own like food network show or whatever. He partnered with this guy called Mr. Beast. Okay. And Mr. Beast, his whole thing is trying to make the world a better place. And so this is what they just did. He used a ton of money and went around the world and gave this surgery to a thousand blind people. And he, he was interviewing this eye doctor who was saying most of these people, like from around the world, this huge number of people who are blind, it could be reversed with a 10 minute surgery. Whoa. And so Mr. Beast teamed up, I mean, because he makes tons of money from his social media, right? Uh, and paid for all of these people, not just in the United States, but around the world to get this 10 minute eye surgery and of course he filmed it and he puts it on social media. He had what a, a huge way to donation. use your money for good, wow. And, that, and that's why, you know, I, I don't yeah. want to just lump all social media into this dark kind of category, even mm -hmm. though there's a huge dark category with phones and texting and social media and apps and all sorts of things. But if you can use your platform in this way, yeah. if you can encourage your kids to follow people like this, mm -hmm. um, I think there can be a huge benefit as well. Just feel like you and I, you know, grownups are not all grownups, by the way, mm -hmm. but we're able to navigate that. We're able yeah. to see the good versus the bad. Stay away from the bad. We're able not to comment on stuff. Some people can't help it. You've had those sure. moments where you're like, must comment. You gotta say something. You know, must say know, something. <laughs> yeah, we've all had those moments, but we're better able to navigate that. Now, uh, now see if your 14 year old self could do the same. Oh God, I, I don't know. I, I say to myself so many times, one, I'm glad there weren't phones when I was younger, taking pictures of everything. But two, understanding that we're not gonna go back to that. So so parents, you know, on one hand, yes, definitely know your kid, monitor your kid if they have social media or phones and things like that. But to think that we're gonna go back to how it was in like the 80s and 90s, I mean, you're just fooling yourself. So educate yourself, follow, track your kid. I'm a huge tracker, my kids. My husband always looks at me, he's like, are you reading something you're not supposed to be reading? I'm like, I am supposed to read everything, thank you. That's so, right. um, yeah. All right, click that thumbs up button before we end the show. I really appreciate you all, great conversations. I know it, it was light, it was funny, it was depressing when we talked about a bunch of stuff, um, but that's what this show is for. Oh yes, Nick, social media, like any tool, can be perverted into a weapon. All a parent can do is teach the proper use and hope the kid listens. I hope my kid listens, absolutely. 
Uh, also, hello to everybody that watches on Facebook. I do see your messages as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And again, uh, please click the thumbs up and visit our exclusive founding sponsor, Steve Moskowitz, triple eight tax deal, Moskowitz, LLP.com. Uh, that's the place to go. Uh, tax season is here. Please support Steve because he supports our show as well. Uh, and now, kick me sign kid himself. Here's Jacob. <laughs> Nikki, you're all so awesome, you sprout, like a beautiful blossom, you're all so the best, I really can't rest, you're all so awesome. <laughs> wow, okay.